Uh, welcome everyone to this new series. Uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, for women only. Uh, today is part one. Uh, the theme is an alpha woman's guide uh, to falling in love and relationships. You'll learn why. Uh, I'm trying to look for the title, but I don't see it. Uh, hopefully this is all recording. Yeah, today you'll learn why alpha women tend to be alone, stressed, or can't sleep at night. And by alpha woman, another way of understanding that is a woman who's uh, ambitious, she's what we would call more masculine, uh, she's less feminine, and while there's certainly a large group of women this way who are CEOs, business owners, workaholics, uh, alone, uh, trying to make everything happen all by themselves, focusing on making money. Uh, that's kind of the alpha woman I'm talking about. But there's different degrees of alpha woman. And clearly, our society is pushing women in that direction. Now, for some women, they're the ones in society that are pushing women in that direction to validate themselves. Because by birth, their own natural tendency is to be expressive of more masculine qualities. As human beings, we all have a unique balance of masculine and feminine qualities. That's just who we are. And uh, it doesn't mean if you're a woman and you have many masculine qualities, you like to be the boss, you like to give directions, you like to control things. That's just a temperament. Uh, and some, some women are more supportive, more nurturing in that way. I'll follow along. We often call that beta. Many men, by nature, they're wonderful. These are their temperament is to be supportive. Uh, they don't care so much about being the leader of the pack. They're the team. They're team players. Uh, we have such a pressure in our society on being the leader, the number one person. It's like if you say somebody's a beta uh, like they're weak or something, but no, it's the team that brings us the farthest. Uh, and so I, I try, I struggle to find the right terms, but I know that many women are, <laughs> they feel complimented if, if they're like strong and powerful and leaders and so forth. The problem is they're, uh, they end up being alone and, uh, or they're stressed uh, or they can't sleep. And uh, they also, uh, another characteristic that may or may not be true is they can't have orgasms. Uh, they can't fall in love. And we want to find out what's the crux of this? What can we do to help these women? And so today, in a series of talks I'll be giving, uh, right now I'm planning to come back on a Thursdays to give this talk. And uh, maybe I should hear this feedback. Hi, Helena. What's up? Are you I'm Are taping. You doing a live Facebook? I'm taping. Yeah, I'm live. Oh, bye. Okay. So I took that call just because uh, sometimes Facebook doesn't work and I, I need to get a little feedback. Uh, I'll take a minute here while people are coming to the show. Uh, just quickly, uh, Joanne, Merit Marna, Joanne, Mohammed. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Arlene. Thanks for coming. And please, thank you for sharing uh, this with your friends. Suzanne Rose. Uh, uh, Joanne, uh, Orion, can you talk about uh, Apex Woman? No, I'm not an alpha woman. <laughs> good, good. You might learn something how not to be an alpha woman if that's not who you are. Hi, John, I'm from Italy. Hi, I'm from Iraq. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So the group's coming in. More people will come in as we're live. Uh, we're talking about alpha women. And another way of saying that is uh, women who are on their male side, but they haven't yet nurtured their female side, so they can also be seen as bossy, controlling. Uh, hi from the UK, Jane, hi from the UK. Carolyn says hi. Nikki says, good to see you again. Uh, Kayler, good to see you. Hello from South Africa. Hi, John. Uh, so many people. 
someone, Mark, is giving a, a description. Uh, what I'm going to do today is focus on this theme and review your questions at, in the second hour and have a check, check out there and the be with me here. Uh, th this, uh, this challenge that we have today is understanding how many women are different and different solutions would apply to men versus to women when we look at how life unfolds. And I want to provide a biological basis of one of these stresses that we're experiencing today. And one of the stresses that we're experiencing is an imbalance of the masculine and feminine parts of who we are. If our whole society tends to be pressuring women to be more on the masculine qualities that they're born with and not validating the female qualities they're born with. And for men, this throws us out of balance. And this show is not primarily about men. It's going to be about helping uh, women understand themselves and helping women understand men to get the love and support they need in their lives. Uh, this show is about, certainly it's for women only, but men can listen in and men can participate uh, to help understand women because women are in a crisis. Males are in a crisis. I wrote a whole book on the boy crisis, which extends into the male crisis, but this is, uh, we wanna to focus today on the challenges that women today are facing. So many, twice as many women than in any other generation in this country uh, throughout history, twice as many women per capita, I mean proportionally, are single and we, we know by the amount of medications that way more women take antidepressants than men. Uh, it's funny, you might be an anti-man person. You say, well, that's because men are no good <laughs> as opposed to let's, let's try to grow up here and take a little responsibility, at least for our unhappiness. Certainly there's injustices in the world, huge injustices to women and huge injustices to men and huge injustices to race, which is the big conversation right now we're having in this country. So yeah, there's discrimination, there's privilege and all that stuff. But what we're focusing on here is what is happening to women because the external, the victimization of women is, can lead women into a place of ironically victimizing themselves, preventing themselves from being happy. Because when you focus on the reason for your unhappiness, the reason for your stress, the reason for your lack of love in your life, the reason why you can't find love again after divorce, the reason why you're single, if that's the case, the reason if you're married, uh, why you're not happy and you feel your husband just not doing this, 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 uh, the reason you can't enjoy sex the way you enjoyed it in the beginning, all of those are victim statements where we blame out to the world. And as long as you blame out to the world, uh, you're trying to control the world, uh, then basically you're not going to find your happiness. You have to find your happiness first. When you can find your happiness first, then you're able to be effective in controlling the world. You want to control your own world. You want to control the people you interact with. You want to be involved in situations where you're getting what you want. You want to have the power to be able to get what you want by using your words. You know, this is all very power. This is all very important, but that's secondary to women. A woman's power comes from her ability to be happy, to have an open heart, to experience pleasure. These are all the qualities of femininity, which are being lost today. We just see women feeling so pressured, so stressed, can't relax. The mind is busy, busy, busy thinking about, oh, I still have to do this. I still have to do this. I still have to do this. I can't relax. I don't have time and so forth. Uh, I invite you to continue making your comments. I love to read your comments after my talks. Uh, I do have a flow today I'm in, and uh, but you can certainly comment. Other people can comment. It's nice to have conversations going on while I'm talking. Uh, but I will continue just staying in, in this flow, um, which is helping us understand the dilemma that women are experiencing today. 
which is we can summarize that by just saying that, you know, we look at statistics is that, you know, women have more depression, women have more anxiety, women have more sleeplessness, uh, women's lifespans are becoming shorter and shorter than men. More women will die of heart attacks than men. Uh, there, there's a lot of problems. Now, women have always lived longer than men, and still, statistically, they stay a little bit longer than men, but now they have more heart attacks. And um, we have massive amount of infertility. And, you know, for some women, they don't mind because they don't care if they have children or not. And, and there's an argument there, which is simply maybe the world has too many people anyway. But we do have a biological destiny. And if a woman isn't going to be able to have babies, she should still be able to make babies. If you can't make babies, something's off. Something's wrong with you. You're more, you're, your system is weaker. And we know the reason for that. It's biologically, reality is... If, here's one example of what makes you infertile as a woman when you're in the childbearing years. And that is working out too much building up too much muscle mass and not having enough fat on your body will prevent you from being able to make a baby. Well, muscle mass is just a metaphor for your masculine qualities. When your masculine qualities are too much, you will, to the extent that your feminine qualities are suppressed, then you will experience higher levels of stress and higher levels of stress interferes with your immune system, interferes with your digestion, interferes with your happiness, and it keeps you from falling in love. So one of the foundations of falling in love for women and then coming back to love again and again is building up this hormone, estrogen. Estrogen is so, so important and it's so low in, in women. And, you know, this crisis isn't just about women. I'm just not going to focus on men. But we look at men, there's a whole crisis of low testosterone in men. And uh, this is just a, a big tragedy. But for women, it's hormonal imbalance. It's PMS, premenstrual syndrome. It's uh, while there's way more men that will commit suicide, there's, way, there's four times as many women who talk about suicide. It's just that. Women don't always go through with the action because if they do talk about it, that because they're talking about it, they will tend to lower their stress levels and come back into a balanced place where they can be more optimistic in life and not want to take their life. They're not going to be in so much pain. Now, ultimately, while I'm talking about for women, I see Helena put up a, a, one of the trainings on our website, which is how to get more me time, which is for women only. And, you know, it's ironic that the, the very women who need it the most are the women who go, oh, I have too much me time. I have too much me time. You're actually uh, not understanding what she means by me time, which is me time is how to feel good, how to make your life so that you're getting everything you want, everything you need, as opposed to uh, feeling alone being so independent. So some women, their, their big problem why they're not happy is they're too independent. So let's go down some of the basics in my book, which was uh, Beyond Mars and Venus, the most recent book. And I'm drawing upon the material in that book for this talk, which is we have two basic sides in us, which is our independent side and our dependent side. And what's interesting is when I in the beginning of the book, I talk about this. My editors, who are women from New York, which is Alpha City, uh, very, very masculine expression city. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with expressing masculinity. It's just when its femininity is suppressed. And here, here these women are saying, we can't put that in the book. That would just upset too many women to say that femininity has to do with needing. So I put in there just for them interdependence, but actually the, the real message is need. Uh, you depend. Uh, need is one thing, but depend. Depending on someone, you're going to tell me what to do and I'm going to follow it. That's called yielding. Uh, that is pure femininity. And I'm going to lead. I'm independent. I'm showing the way. That's masculinity. And that's boss. Boss and team. Now, the best boss is someone who listens to their team. And team members don't mind if they feel included and respected. 
So if you're going to be boss, you need to respect the people that support you. So there's a nice balance there. There's this big misinterpretation in the past, which is if you want a man, you should, you know, just to keep a man happy, you need to just respect him. And, and of course, men, everybody wants respect. We all need respect. But the secret here, if you want to be, a, if you want to have a leader, they have to respect you. And when the leader doesn't respect the follower, then the follower feels abused. And one of the big mistakes throughout history was this unconditional respect of men, you know, because in a dysfunctional world, in a dysfunctional world, what's going to happen is when men are not rewarded for what they do and they become dysfunctional because their testosterone goes down or when men don't earn what they get. So they're born rich or they're the king, you know, the prince, you know, the, the arrogant prince. They, if, if they don't earn their way, uh, they also have no testosterone. So when you have this low testosterone man, he demands respect because he's insecure. He demands respect and he's violent and he's angry and he's selfish. He's narcissistic. And so the only remedy in a dysfunctional world where we don't have communication skills, you have to realize we're in a different world now. We have communication skills. Back then, basically, we're almost like monkeys. Anybody who lives a life of revenge, you know, where you don't, we don't, when you, when you don't aspire towards forgiveness and love, you're living in a world of an eye for an eye. That's primitive. That's monkey. You know, monkey behavior is you step on my foot. I can't communicate to you. Hey, you know, that really hurts. So if I don't have the words for it and now I make a bunch of noises and you still don't get it, but you laugh at me, I got to step on your foot as well. And now, you know, that hurts. See, so don't do that again. So all this getting even stuff and controlling stuff is, is, uh, is simply uh, primitive. And we all have this primitive part of our brain. If you want to have love in your life, you've got to acknowledge, I am this primitive being. I am this animal and I do all these things. And notice how you do it. These are reactions. These are automatic reactions and explore them. Don't act on them explore them, see through them, see that they're not productive and don't act on them. If you act on them, you reinforce them and they control you. So many of you know, I've been doing my fast now. This would be 18 days. Saturday night, I was invited to dinner by one of my daughters. So I took a day off, which is again, when you make a commitment, you do it. And also you have to live in a realistic world where you adjust and you adjust. But other than that, I've been doing my liquid fast and I feel fantastic. I just wanted to update all of you. Uh, now, the uh, last week I did that great talk on fasting and spiritual growth. I have had the most amazing spiritual breakthroughs uh, from doing this fast. Absolutely amazing. And, and wonderful new insights come when your mind is clear and, and you're at rest and confident and peaceful. So, uh, you know, you can go back to my Facebook lives and do my meditation classes there. If you do them again and again, you'll still learn more and more. They're the basics. Um, and even when it comes to alpha women, they need meditation more than ever. Uh, and the, the, the kind of meditation I suggest uh, for the alpha woman, the woman who's more on her male side, uh, is a meditation which allows you to not be alone like a yoga class uh, or being an aerobic class, being with other people singing in a choir, you know, being together is a really good meditation where you're either, you know, singing, chanting, uh, making this service. That's called seva in the Eastern tradition, which is being of service with others as a group. These are all great meditations, but the quiet meditation, which is many women feel I just and my mind's too busy. I think that's really, really important. The more alpha you are, because you're already on your male side, which is the capacity to stay focused on one thing. But you're also feminine, so you can go in a flow. So you can actually do the more advanced techniques. Um, so there's the quiet meditation where you just do mantra, 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 whatever it might be. Or you witness your breath, you notice your breath and you're alone and you do that. That's one, but for women particularly, it's very, very good to do um, in addition to that or instead of that, 
to do follow the leader. Follow the leader. Whenever you follow the leader, you're yielding, you're allowing someone to guide you. And, you know, this is just like the most powerful, powerful thing you can do is have somebody guide you. Not all the time. It's kind of like you can be alpha at work and beta at home. You know, it's um, you can be uh, control your world or you can <laughs> control your life. Uh, I like to talk about empowerment for men and women. You know, women are also empowered. They're empowered to express their male side, but they don't know what their female power is. What is female power? Well, I like to put this distinction in there because it's really quite wonderful. Because uh, I was just reading some notes, seeing the conversation going on there. Uh, I was empowered to see the, uh, the, uh, the power of masculine side and female side. My masculine side is, you know, I get up and I give this talk. I, I say, I'm going to do it, and I do it. My masculine side says, I'm going to do a fast for 18 days. I'm going to do a fast for 18 days. Uh, now I'm going to do, I'm going to continue on for 30 days. Um, you know, some people say, 30-day fast. Well, once you get over the first two days, it's fine. It's not as you're not looking at food. But then, the only time I've been tempted to eat food, and I, I did, I did uh, last night, watching the Republican convention. And whether you're, whether you're left or right, you can watch either the right side or the left side, and what you'll see is omissions. See, they're all about manipulating you uh, to vote for them. So whether it's listening to the Democrats or the Republicans, and just look at both stations and you'll see they both do this. They're petty, they omit, they don't tell you the whole thing, you know, the Democrats on one side say, oh, we've got all these wonderful, peaceful demonstrations. And on the other side, they're saying, oh, the whole city's up in fire and there's chaos and there's horrible things happening, you know. <laughs> and, and there are little sections, little tiny sections. You see all this stuff happening and it gets blown up into the news and they get their photo ops showing the smoke and the, the police and all that. These are little, little events. And then over here, you've got these you know, all these demonstrators, why can't they say, you know, we've had demonstrations, but we've also had three people die, but we've had millions of people in the streets for Black Lives Matter. No, we want to just focus on one side of the story. Have you ever felt like something bad happened, you know, to you, and you want to tell that story and get some attention for it, and get some sympathy for it, and empathy for it? We tend to tell the story in such a way that gets the most empathy, which is we omit what we did to contribute to it, we omit the facts that will go against what we say. We just focus on one side. So the sin of omission is a lie. It's just like lying. And then there's lies. There's actually lies that are said. There's omissions that are said. There's denials that are said. There's blame, 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 blame. You know, and why do we do that? Because we're all like, this is the world we live in. We do it in our relationships all the time. We're always committing a mission if there's a problem. Whenever you have an argument, you're always, oh, there's an, a sin of a mission is not revealing how much I love you, how appreciative I am, how grateful I am in your life. You know, so what I see up there, I see, you know, we're doing in our own lives. It was just so much of it that it threw me out of balance. See, what happens is whenever you listen to lies, you discon and you believe you, even not even not believing it. I have to keep talking to myself. Well, that's not true, and that's not true, and that's an omission, and that's a blame, and that's a lie, and that's a victimization, and that's negative projection. That's inducing fear. That's a manipulation. You know, when you can understand this, you have to actually. What I have to do, and in, in the old days, I used to have to do it out loud. I used to drive Bonnie crazy. This is during the the Bush administration when. Uh, George Bush said <laughs> we had to go kill Saddam Hussein. He had nothing to do with 9-11. Nobody, suddenly they're saying Saddam Hussein, we got to go in Iraq for Saddam Hussein, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And I'm over there going, lies, lies, lies. And Because and, I had to say it out loud. Now I can do it more mentally, but I do have to do it because what you see on the TV goes into your subconscious mind. It all goes into your subconscious mind. Repetition, repetition. You know, we've talked about it before. The... You know, it's in Hitler's book, uh, which is, if you want people to believe a lie, tell a bigger lie. <laughs> it's a, it just, 
it's so big it must be true and then repeat it over and over and over and people believe it this is this is kind of this is power of suggestion and the tv the box has such a power uh, over us and so i sat there watching it till finally my my all my confidence and my willpower not that i noticed any of this it just i suddenly felt this huge craving to go eat some salty chips so you know, <laughs> at least what i did I had a little bit of wisdom, of course, I always have my wisdom, but not always the control, effortless control I'm talking about, ease and comfort. So I effortlessly went over and got some chips, uh, organic chips, but still. And then I, I put ghee on them, so at least if I was going to have carbohydrates, I would add some butter. You always want to make sure that healthy butter, uh, so that that carbohydrate doesn't immediately shoot into your bloodstream, otherwise... Uh, kind of defeats the purpose of your fast. You want to get into a fat burning state. And if you eat sugar, carbohydrates is like sugar, or refined carbohydrates, then it causes a spike in your blood sugar, lowers, uh, which then spikes up and goes down. And the way it goes down is that sugar turns into fat and gets stored. Um, for those of you that have issues and you want to lose weight, uh, or you find it's hard to fast, so usually blood sugar issues and women often say that hard for them to do a one or two day fast because and and, and it's psychological but it's also it's it is hard uh, because you have different blood sugar issues for women your blood sugar if it goes up uh, too high just eating carbohydrates processed carbohydrates will make it go up a bit too high and then over time it has a tendency to do that that's called insulin resistance just any carbohydrates will go too high, then your body has to lower it. Otherwise, it causes brain damage. Oxidative stress in the brain is high blood sugar. So your body says, danger, lower the blood sugar. And that's anybody who gets tired after eating, that's low blood sugar generally. But you, your blood sugar goes up. Now your blood sugar has to go down. And the way your blood sugar comes back down because it was too high is your body converts it into something called triglycerides, which are fats. They get stored as fat and they're harder to release. Okay, they, they get stuck in your body harder. So, you, so what happens is men have an easier time fasting because our increased muscle mass allows us to convert uh, used sugar back into sugar. There's a process where the, the muscles use the sugar to f produce ATP or energy and then it converts that sugar uh, into, goes into the liver, gets converted back into a substance like sugar that raises your blood sugar back up. So you don't all have all this insulin that gets produced that ends up lowering your blood sugar by converting your sugar into fat. All that said, and that's just so men could, if they don't push too hard, they can just keep going and going and going and going. So they're convert, they had that conversion process. Women can do that as well. It's just they tend to, if they're stressed, it tends to get blocked right away. And uh, the solution for that, you know, I was giving that long explanation. I didn't really mean to get too scientific with you there, but for some, you'll, you'll enjoy that. Uh, the solution is berberin, by the way, berberin. So if you're gonna fast, uh, you wanna, for women, you need to do uh, more berberin. Uh, there's a product at marsvenus.com called glycol. Glyco X, which is berberine and banaba, two natural herbs that help balance normal blood sugar. So, and it makes the brain work better, it makes everything, and it also becomes another way you can help stabilize your hormones that tend to be changing uh, for both men and women. So, having come back to, to that distraction, <laughs> I'm gonna have some Jawa tea. Uh, <clears throat> that chawa is a Japanese formula which has 10 different adaptogens, one being green tea, uh, but the rest are things like goji berries and um, mushrooms, all the different mushrooms are in there that are good for the brain and the body and so forth. It's a wonder wonderful little drink and it's a... Uh, <sighs> Help, help me come back to my focus here. I guess I'm drawn over to your questions and comments. I'll just see what's over there right now for a minute. Oh yeah, I hear people. So what I was talking about was this dysfunctional thing in the past and how 
the way women adapted in order to be safe from these dysfunctional males, and not all were dysfunctional, you know, we've evolved, you know, but at the same time, usually all dysfunction comes from the top. You know, we start with like the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, where they, you know, any woman who had power, they made her into a witch. Anybody who wanted to say, hey, drink some uh, uh, natural herbs in order to feel good, they burned you at the stake. It's no longer the Catholic Church trying to control in that way, that control your health. It's now the pharmaceutical industries. We just have to really get uh, pharmaceutical industries. Uh, please, 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 everybody should go see Plandemic 2. Uh, so, <clears throat> just just some old news, old news statements about the dangers of yielding to the pharmaceutical industry, unless you're having an emergency crisis, you know, I mean, that's the medical industry, just such great evolution of information. It's just that they're indoctrinated in a way that says anything natural is not good. In the same way, we've done the same thing. Our cu culture is indoctrinated to women into femininity is weakness. Uh, Gloria Steinem, just so you know, go do a search for Gloria Steinem, CIA, <laughs> Gloria. <laughs> We'll say she was in an interview like 30 years ago or something. She was a CIA agent. Uh, this is all a plan of the government to uh, basically encourage role reversal. Uh, it's more taxpayers, the simple way of looking at it. Uh, if you go back to ancient Egypt, I was there next to the pyramids, and the, the mayor of the town there, uh, he told me that the pharaoh uh, was able to make, make the uh, Israeli men weak so they wouldn't revolt by having them do women's work and women do men's work. Role reversal weakens us. There's no doubt about it. When women, we see today as women are more independent, they're more powerful. Uh, not all. Okay, there's a solution to this. You know, I'm the solution for this. My message is the solution for this. Uh, maybe I should get to that right away. So, Because I'm not saying that women shouldn't be powerful. I'm saying that some women, that's their natural tendency. They need to balance that with their feminine side. And uh, if, the, if they don't, then they're going to be unhappy. And a lot of women don't even have that much ambition and masculine side qualities. They don't even want to be that independent. But our society, the structure of society, the breakdown of marriage, the, the uh, forces women into that situation where they can't have a partner to depend upon for their emotional fulfillment. And when it comes to meditation, I was saying that the key to good meditation is <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of these things you can get on, online. There are guided meditations where somebody is saying, now relax, you know, watch your breath. Now we're going to go to this state or this state or this state. Uh, think about this. There are guided meditations, there are hypnosis states, you know, this hypnosis is really just guided meditation, really. It's just allow yourself to relax, you're in the walking on a beach, you feel the nice sand under your feet, you imagine a breeze flowing around you. Uh, several times I've talked about this course that you can learn about online called DNRS, DNRS for... Um, neural retraining system, dynamic neural retraining system. And there, they're retraining people who have a high overreactivity by looking, those are triggers, looking at your triggers and then imagining, then taking time, it's a process, but taking time just simply to, it's like a meditation, recalling a time when you felt really happy, a time when you felt loved, a time when you, may, when you felt safe, and creating a story around it, you know, putting colors in it, putting sounds in it, imagining smells in it, and just be in that imaginary state. Because what you're doing, we now know that's neuroplasticity. You're growing positive neural connectors, positive experiences connected to that negative thing that was triggering you. And so what we need to do is generate positive experiences. Because once we have negative experiences, we tend to obsess on that. We get addicted to negative experiences. And 
what happens is when women go on their male side, once they get encouraged to go there, it does feel good. Oh, for sure, every woman, when they've learned to be experienced more independence, if they were suppressed, uh, if they're only on their female side, you're moving to your male side, there's a transition point there where you feel feminine and you feel like, but I'm not allowed to do the things guys are doing. I'm not allowed to make money. I'm not allowed to vote. I'm not allowed to do all this stuff. You know, I have to depend on a guy and my guy's no good. I want to, I want to break free from this. Okay. So that's like repression and that's part of our history. And I was mentioning that men as leaders, when they didn't earn it, or where they weren't well paid became dysfunctional and then you couldn't depend on them. They were unworthy of your trust and they would become irritable and grumpy and demanding and negative. And so the only tool women had in this primitive world to deal with that was to respect men. Because if you respect men, then you calm them down. Basically you say, oh, you're right. Oh, okay, I'll do what you say. Yes, I'll do what you say, because whenever you respect a man, the uh, imagination, in his imagination, he imagines it's because you appreciate his greatness so much. You appreciate, because you appreciate his greatness, you're respecting him. But the reality is he's not fulfilling your needs, so you don't appreciate. So to respect a man that you don't appreciate is actually poisoning him to make him even worse. So women, to survive a, a, a dysfunctional male, they would respect him, they would yield to him, they would honor him in that way of, you, I'll follow you even when I don't appreciate you. So yeah, you, it's good to be on your female side. See, when you're on your female side, you're in a place of love, appreciation. That's female power. So what is male power? I was talking about that. That's where I got distracted. Male power is, look what I can do, okay? I said I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it. And every time I say I'm going to do something and do it and follow through, uh, and, I, and I do it in a good way, uh, then your male power increases. Look what I can do. See what I can do. What am I going to do about it? And take action. Uh, that's your masculine power. What is your female power? Your female power is using your power inside to get other people to do things for you. So that's female power. And of course, it can be effective female power and it can be not effective female power, just as men can have effective male power and ineffective male power, you know, like yelling and screaming, you know, in a primitive world that worked. Well, women's communication power in a, in a primitive world, it worked because if a man was angry, you could make him right and then he would think he was so appreciated. So now we go higher consciousness. We realize not to respect men, appreciate men. And then if you appreciate him, then respect him. But men have to learn how to respect a woman. Okay, Respecting someone is for serving their needs. The, the leader is there to serve the needs of those who follow him. Okay, the leader woman is there to serve the needs of those who follow her. See, that, that's the dynamic. And nowhere in here am I saying women cannot be leaders. I'm just saying that if you don't balance being a leader with being a follower, then you're going to be out of balance. You need to have that female side. So it's, it's if you're a big boss at work and you tell everybody what to do and decisions have to be made by you, decision making, that's also a masculine quality. If you have to make decisions, then are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? You're on your male side. So your man in your life, if you want a woman, if you want a woman, you want to have successful relationships, you need to have a man in your life and you let him make decisions for you. But what does that mean? Are you powerless? No, you have the female power. You have the power to say, well, this is what I would appreciate and I don't appreciate that. What else can we do? You see, it's, it's literally like we have a president, theoretically, who makes decisions. And then we have two sets of Congress, okay? We got Congress that says, well, you can't do that. <laughs> we have to vote on that first, you know? This is, you know, you have to have this balance of powers and relationships. But and when you get to this higher level I'm talking about, it's you really acknowledge that 
You want to empower the man in your life by letting him make decisions. Don't tell him what to do. So I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of, you know, always being in charge just emasculates a man. You want to create a space where he can be in charge, but you also have the power. You have the power to negate. You have the power to go, this is what I would like and this is what I would like. Because the power that you have women in, in, in relationship to men, not necessarily in the work world, okay, but this is your power relationship, your intimate world, this is your relationship world, is that men want to make you happy. That's their major motivation. That's not your motivation. <laughs> you, you don't realize it, see? see uh, I, the man just wants to make the woman happy. So your job is to be happy and then when he, and, and you say, well, this would make me happy and this would make me happy and this would make me happy. We, what, what should we do? Let him decide based upon what makes you happy. And when something doesn't make you happy, be very careful how you communicate that. Why? And that's unique communication skills for this. Uh, the Primitive communication skills is if he doesn't make the right decision, you get all upset with him. Oh, I'm going to get all upset. I get upset. That's what monkeys do. And instead of getting upset, what you do is you practice one of our new relationship skills. Look, honey, this is not a big deal. I just want to talk about what happened yesterday. And I, I just, first of all, I want you to know, I just, I, uh, I, I think you're the most wonderful husband in the world. I love you. I know you work so hard and I knew you were probably really, really tired and you forgot to call me i waited two hours whatever it was and or you left your you know the a big mess in the living room or you were going to help with the party you didn't help with that or you know i saw they would you spent all this money on this thing and i don't know if we have enough money and i know you you work really hard for that money and i know you work so you know you do so much uh, but i just wanted to tell you how it makes me feel and i just need to talk about it, then i'll feel better and it's not a big deal well, if you say that, he'll hear what you say and he will respect you. Because if you don't appreciate a man, he will not respect what you have to say. Now, what am I teaching men? You should respect men. But I'm teaching you women. This is your empowerment. And as I'm talking about this, I, I recall one time after doing many Oprah shows with her, she said, John, we, we really need to do this show. It's called, um, we need to help women who've been dumped. So she had a whole audience of women who've been dumped by men. And she said, now, John, we need to tell them what they should do to solve this problem. I said, you don't tell a woman who feels she's been dumped how to solve that problem. So this talk is about what you can do, okay, if you're alone or you're stressed and you're not happy. And it's if you want help. But those women just, they didn't, they didn't want help. They wanted someone to reinforce their monkey, monkey victimness. And, uh, and there's a place to do that. You know, this, this is a place to validate that. Women need to feel heard. They need to feel understood. They don't get it. They get men ridiculing them, putting them down. Uh, they end up being with these jerks. They end up guys who don't commit. They end up with guys who deny, who lie, who deceive. But so do women. That's what you got to get. You're, you're playing the game too. You're buttering up to men. You give them appreciation when they don't deserve it. You overdo it. You try to please them. You give them sex until they really make you feel safe and loved. All kinds of manipulations. You, know, you really have to come clean on what your manipulations are. Uh, let's see. I was writing them down to this morning. I was thinking about the, the, uh, the political talks that I was hearing. And uh, cover-ups, okay, so many cover-ups. They just basically lies. They don't want to say what they're doing. Omissions, that's the big one, which I talked about. Denials, we're not this. Blame, negative stories, uh, exaggerations. Uh, all this is order to manipulate. And we have to see how we do it as well. It's, 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 uh, this bad, 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 bad. Both sides do it. We all do it. And that's why we're all going down when it comes to our relationships. We see it. And, and for women, what do you do? First of all, you recognize that you're the cause of your problems. It's not men. And if, if women, if men are unhappy with women and men aren't have a woman in their life, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. But we, if you want to do something about this, if you want to change your life, you've got to change yourself. It's not about changing somebody else. 
Now, if a man wants to change his life, he's got to change his actions, okay? Mindset and actions, okay? He's got to change his mindset. He's got to take the, every problem. If there's a problem, what am I going to do differently about this? What do I need to do differently? That's his story. That's not your story, women. Your story is, how do I feel differently about this? How do I feel differently about this? A man needs to focus on what do I need to do to serve others? That's your solution, men, over and over. What do I need to do to serve others if I'm stressed? That's always going to be the case. To solve a problem that has a positive outcome for myself, of course, but also for others. Okay, so there's both those. That's the action side of us. Women, that's not your power. Your power is your feelings. If you just get that. So what do you do? You go, your first step is, how do I generate the positive feelings to attract support? What do I need and how do I ask for it? And how do I ask for it in such a way where I get it? So now I, I'm basing that on, I was reflecting on what I wrote in my book. Uh, uh, it's not behind me, but it's called Men, Women, and Relationships. It was my first book on gender differences. It's a quite, a, quite an amazing book. It's very thick. Uh, it was, I wrote it before, Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. And I, I was reflecting on some of the ideas in that book. And one of them was some of the early brain research that I was looking at that those days. And I didn't study the brains. I read other brain researchers, okay. And I just observed behaviors. And what they found is that this is so great. The, uh, oh, the request I have, I know many of my coaches are listening, Mars Venus coaches get on here, is whenever I say something of value or important, or significant, or you want to sum it up what I said, do that. Do that in the comments. That really helps me a lot. Uh, this is all going to be going into a book which I write, which will be for women only. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus for women only. So I'm just roughing out the ideas with you today and for next, next Thursday and next Thursday. Uh, I'll, I'll just keep working with this. And and looking at your questions that come up as well as the summary statements that you come up with. So that's kind of my intent here. That's how I usually write my books is I'll start teaching a bunch of classes, which is a bit easier for me to refine my ideas because I actually see my audience and I can see responses of, I can connect, you know, I'm very intuitive, almost telepathic. Where, where I can connect in that way. It's a little harder when I can't see my audience, but your comments do, do help me a lot. So women's power is the ability to attract support. Men's ability is to give support. So there's a giving, that's your masculine side. There's a receptivity, that's your female side. And we can see this in the brain function, which I was talking about in my book, Men, Women, and Relationships. If you can find it, it's a great book. And... Uh, if you can get the original, the, the later version I cut in half because nobody ever got to the end. I just, well, if you're not going to, if you're not going to read it, I'm not going to give it to you. Just let you feel that sense of accomplishment reading half the book. So the, the, um, uh, the, the difference is if you look at a stress response, when you have the adrenaline response in men and women, so this means you're not just cruising along, heart open, feeling really good. Suddenly there's like, oh, frustration some disappointment, some concern, some worries, some doubting, uh, some not comfortable with this, this isn't easy for me. All right, that's normal life. We all go through it, okay? So the, so that's your first adrenaline response. It can be little, get bigger, bigger, bigger. And as I mentioned last week, if that adrenaline response doesn't go away, uh, if you don't clear the adrenaline, then you go into cortisol. And cortisol causes huge role reversal, causes women to go away from their female side, causes men to go away from their masculine side, makes men overly emotional, makes women overly doing oriented. So the woman's power, and you can see it right biologically, is under adrenaline, which is your not fully in danger, but you're moving towards danger, right? If you don't do something, something bad will happen. And that's not really a, a, a cortisol state. You know, when you're driving a car, you're always in somewhat of an adrenaline response. It just gets higher and higher, then it turns to cortisol. Uh, let me correct that. It, actually, you could be driving and it's no adrenaline at all. It's dopamine. 
and then you know there's a it, there's a little danger a little danger but you're in control of it now you're in adrenaline and then when you start feeling like i'm really a bit out of control you're in cortisol but you don't have to be all the way out of control to have cortisol you just have to have a buildup of adrenaline and it doesn't get used up so that's really key is how to use up your adrenaline well it comes out you see when there's this little adrenaline response what happens in women is an increase of blood flow to the limbic system of the brain that's back here most of the middle part of the brain it's the more monkey part of the brain as opposed to the snake part of the brain that's the the fight or flight center which is cortisol gets produced that's going to be uh, it's twice as big in men uh, and but the limbic system is more the emotional memories the hippocampus is where the emotional memories are and for women there's eight times increase of blood flow to that part of the brain and specifically to another part of the brain as well that lights up when we ask for help so for women their first response is emotional and asking for help and that's feminine feminine says help me and then think about the power the power of saying you know, I don't have to do this. I get other people to do it for me. It's effortlessness. It's grace. It's fluidity. Uh, that's female power. Attractiveness. People come and hear you speak. People come and buy your product. Uh, people fall in love with you. People kneel before you. People care for you. That's feminine power. That's your power, women. That comes from your emotions that are positive. If you're a monkey, it comes from positive and negative emotions. Okay. Negative emotions was, if you're a woman, you're, oh, you're pouting and you're so upset. And the man says, oh, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? So if he's not helping you, what do you do? You pout, you get upset. Oh, it was ter terrible. Oh, I'll come help you. I'll come help you. <laughs> do, you do you see the logic there? Always, oh, you see a little child crying. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? The child can't say, hey, mom, help me. I'm hungry. They're monkeys, they're little monkeys. They have to cry and someone's crying out. What do you do? He brings, pulls in the male energy. I wanna solve your problem. I wanna solve your problem. But this is monkey. This is not human. This is not your higher self. This is not your big power. This is weakest form of communication is negative emotions. But you're designed as a monkey, okay? Part of our brain is designed as a monkey. So what happens is when you're not getting what you need, women, not getting what you want, need, wish, intend, whatever, is you, your female power comes into play and you, wanna, you need help. So the part of you that will light up when you ask for help gets activated. I need help. And because you don't have communication skills, the way you get help is being emotional. So you have eight times blood flow going to the emotional part of the brain. And then you get more and more of that blood flow because it worked. The more it works, the more you go to your emotions to get what you want, to get what you need. You go to your anger, you go to your hurt, you go to your sadness, you go to your disappointment. So as soon as a little, just, just a, a little uh, adrenaline response, the emotions come up and you've got this husband and, and, and maybe the first 10 times he got emotional, he was very compassionate, empathetic, and he went, you know, I solved that problem. I listened and she felt better. Why does it keep coming back? You see, that's why men are good listeners often in the beginning, if they're somewhat healthy, <laughs> you'll be upset, they'll be so interested. Oh, what is it? What's going on? What's going on? And he just listens and then he'll get some piece of advice or something and you'll feel better because he really listened. That's the whole thing about it. And then he thinks in his mind, well, I did that, so now she should feel better, okay? She shouldn't, this shouldn't happen again and again and again. <laughs> but when it happens again and again and again, he says, nothing works with this woman, nothing works. Because in our mindset, it's kind of like, I fixed it, it shouldn't keep happening. Because we think that's broken. It's not broken, that's her stress response. That's how she copes with stress. That's what she does to get help when she's stressed. And then what happens is when that doesn't work, now for alpha women, what they do is they, they say, well, that's stupid. Those emotions, that doesn't work. And, and so they'll uh, deny their emotions. That's weakness, that's craziness, that's stupidity, that's unlovable, 
no man will care about me if I show that part of me, if I reveal that part of me. Um, and so then they push their female side away and they become on their male side, which is what we do on our male side when those emotions show up is don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. It's water under the bridge. No problem. Look, forget it. I uh, can't handle it anyway. Now, that's the way we used to do it as men. We'd suck it up. And, and that made us very masculine. The problem doing too much of that disconnects us from our female side. But it also made us strong. But it disconnects us from our female side. And that's okay to disconnect from your female side if you have a job that's in service of others and they appreciate you. Because whenever a man feels appreciated, he is now going to feel, uh, he resonates with that appreciation and he goes to his female side and lets it in. Okay, oh yes, I'm wonderful. Oh yes, I feel loved. Thank you so much. You pay a man well. Oh, thank you so much. He goes to his receptive side if he can be productive. So the way the man grows and balancing to his female side is not by feeling emotions and expressing emotions and so forth. That's, it's by taking action that serves people and that connects him to his female side. They appreciate him. And so he goes, yes, thank you so much for that. And then you got the dark, dark side of life is what men do is if they can't connect with their pain because they have these dysfunctional parents and they've got all this pain in their emotional side, their female side is wounded in childhood. And male have a female side from age two to 14 or 13. A man has the estrogen levels of a little girl. A little boy is like a little girl. He's different, his brain is different because for the first two years he has more testosterone but he has the testosterone of a grown man, but then he shifts over and develops his more monkey side, which is more emotional and so forth as a little boy through, through a, a male brain. But still, he has all that estrogen, so he has more emotion, more tenderness, more feeling, more love, and all that stuff. Uh, it's, so it's in there, and if it's been wounded, it can be triggered as an adult male, and it comes up. And when it comes up, if it's from childhood, Again, what you do at that point is you, you, that's where, you know, my healing the heart work is so important for both men and women. The distinction is uh, particularly, particularly, particularly for men, if you're emotionally upset, you don't want to buy into it being about right now. It's about your childhood wounds uh, from age two, uh, generally speaking, age two to 13. When, when you weren't able to fully express how you felt at that time and have somebody heal you, have somebody give you what you need. But most importantly, uh, men now, as adults, as uh, beyond you know, puberty, when they go to their emotional side, it's either healing, un it's unresolved issues coming up, or it's he doesn't have training as a man in order to be on his masculine side. So in short, to summarize what I just said, Every woman wants a man to be more loving. So how does a woman become more loving? Well, if she has that stress response of negative emotions, more emotions come up, which is the primitive way to ask for help, she learns how to transform negative emotions into positive emotions and then ask for help. Because you ask for help with positive emotions, you get change, and that's how you get more from a man. So I'm going to summarize here what I just went through is the kind of the biological basis of how women can get more from men in their relationships. And the priority of that is be happy. And that's Lauren's, you know, feel good woman course called how to get more me time. The me time is you're busy doing, doing, doing. Me time is actually doing those things for yourself that make you happy. And then learning how, once you're in a relationship, how to continue doing those things that make you happy so your partner does not have the power to make you unhappy. If a partner does not have the power to make you unhappy, more and more every day, every day, they'll stop doing anything that used to make you unhappy. And then they'll start doing more and more and more of what they learn to do to make you happier. So men, we have to learn how to stop making women unhappy first and then learn how to make them happier. But 
uh, but women, this is about you. You have the power. Your power is to get men to do whatever you want. That's an amazing power. And the problem is there's a power in expressing powerlessness. And then you use that power even by defining the perception of powerlessness of women to get power. To emphasize the powerlessness of women to get power. It's just creating more powerlessness in women. This is, this is so sad. So it's a, let, let's look at this. Complaining. You did this again and again. How many times are you going to do that? Why did you do that? How could you forget? These are like little complaints that you might hear from a woman. Often men say nagging and complaining and controlling are the three big things they don't like about you. They kill relationships. And most women get that they nag and most women get they complain too much. Uh, but they, uh, they don't realize how controlling they are. And the reason you don't realize how controlling you can be is because you don't live by the code, by the biological imperative of men that we need to make testosterone. And testosterone goes up when what we say or what we do creates a positive response in you, when you're happy. Now, if I'm happy and you're, if you're happy and I'm happy, you're happier, no doubt about it. You know, we grow in happiness. We, but if, if you're unhappy and I go, oh, I don't know why you're so unhappy. We had such a great life. I love it. I had a great time this week. Why are you complaining so much? Does that make you happier? But let's say you got a husband who's complaining. Oh, you know, my job's so hard. And you go, oh, honey, I'm just so grateful. You know, you, <laughs> you work so hard for me. I just, I'm so lucky to have you as my husband. And this, is, this was the distinction. I saw that that day so clearly. There's two distinctions here, and I want you to understand them, women. Because you think you're so noble. You think you want him to be happy, and your love is... Yes, if you're happy, you want him to be happy. If, he, if you're not happy, you could care less about his happiness. Matter of fact, if you're not happy and he's happy, you want to pull him down. Whether you're conscious of it or not, you can start becoming aware of it, how you want to pull him down. Um, so here's, because you want equal, equal, everybody should be the same. If I suffer, you should suffer. We should all suffer together. And, but see, men aren't that way, you know, if you're suffering, we, we, we want to make you happier. Okay, so there's a, we feel, sort of getting an awareness there about that. I'm not sure if what I'm about to say is right, but let me come to my two stories and I'll see if I can come back to that idea that's emerging inside of me as I'm talking. But the, the, uh, here's the one distinction I saw so clearly. I was working on a book, uh, and when I, when I, when I actually get into writing, I write like I meditate. I can meditate 16 hours a day, go like that. You know, I did this week at least eight hours, four days, four or five days. I did eight hours of meditation. Because, you know, I'm staying home, I'm not traveling all the time. But even when I traveled, I'd be in these long plane flights, 12-hour meditation I can do very easily. I feel like it's my vacation. So anyway, uh, the so I, I'm working on a book, and just like a workaholic, you know, I'm a meditation-holic, so don't put it so high up in the air there. And so they're, they're I'm writing, 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 writing. Literally, my hands start becoming like a machine gun, you know, when you really get into it. I'm not that good of a typist either, except once I get going, then it all opens up. Da, 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 da. So having said that, 18 hours are big, big, long, you know, getting up at two o'clock in the morning and typing till nine o'clock in the next, next night, you know, with no breaks, not eating, you know. And this has been going on for days. My beard is growing out and I look like an old man. My hair is all oily, no time to bathe. So, so I came up. My poor wife, she put up with so much when I write a book, okay? And, and <laughs> uh, in retrospect, I realized so much how much she gave to produce those Mars Venus books, just in terms of being so non-demanding of me at those times. Uh, so what it, what it, it was her gift to the world was to support me during those times when I write books. And not all my books were that way. Uh, my best book of all, the most powerful, influential book in the world that I've written is... Uh, 
Minute from Mars, and that book was a rewrite of men, women, and relationships, and that's a whole beautiful story, but uh, I wrote that every day for six hours. I, I'd take my kids to school, I'd sit down and write, and I'd pick my kids up from school. That was it. That's the only time I wrote. It was really very organized, uh, the way I did that one. But anyway, so I'm, I'm cranking out these, these this book, and I came up into the room, and I'm just feeling uh, like a dead man, and I was satisfied, you know? I mean, you feel accomplishment. You work hard. You, you really give it every bit of juice you got, you know? And I'm, I'm sitting there, and she was so sweet. She looked at me with compassion and empathy, and she just, uh, first of all, she quietly went and got a bowl of hot water with salt in it, and she... She put it in, which is called respecting your man. She was respecting me, yes. But why did she respect me? It was real respect. Because she appreciated how hard I worked for people and for her and for the family and so forth. She had a heart full of appreciation. Then she gave to me. See, she went to her male side. When you respect someone, you're going to your male side. So she was in balance. That was a perfect moment where she felt so much admiration for me, for my dedication, appreciation for me, for giving my, my, giving my best to the world. And then she respected me. She quietly got a little bowl of water, warm water, and put salt in it. She said, John, soak your hands in this bowl of water. And I went, oh, this feels so good. Comforted. And there's nothing like being nursed after fighting a battle. Okay, so, so there I am being nursed at. And she said to me, I am so glad, John, that I don't have your job. And that was like one of the most romantic things she could ever say to me. I just felt like a million bucks. Now, why did I feel like such a million bucks? Because it was, I'm so glad that you're doing something that I don't have to do so we can have this life in this world. I'm so glad. That's happiness. Now, Imagine I come home, and now this is the next story. I come home from, this the flip side of it, to help understand that, because some people don't get it right away, the, the power of what she just said. Because if she, if I was, I came home from work, and, and she just had a long day working and all kinds of things, well, let's just say, in our situation, it could be whether you, you go to the office and nobody did this and there were too many messages and they're expecting me to do this. They, they don't appreciate me and they don't do this and they don't do that. <laughs> and you come home and you're just burnt out and your husband's been home playing video games, having a good time, doing the things he enjoys doing. And he says, oh, honey, I am so glad I don't have your job. I get to be here at this house and I know you're out there working so hard, but I'm so happy I don't have to do that. <laughs> Thank you. How do you feel? <laughs> you feel like, yeah, you are all the good stuff. You get to do the good stuff. I'm out there doing all this. Because his, his heartfelt appreciation and acknowledgement of you, it doesn't ring a bell inside of you. That's why I have to teach women. It's not that you're looking for appreciation. What you're looking for is respect. If you look for respect from a man, then you will, you'll be looking in the right direction. It's what can I, what do I need from him? How do I ask for what I want from him? You ask for what you want only after you appreciate and only coming from a place of appreciation. But see, that's too complex for a monkey. How can, how can I ask for more and, and, and appreciate you? Well, why would you ask for more from anybody if you don't appreciate them? Don't, ask, don't go to somebody that, that's never done anything for you and, and ask for something. See, the logical thing, see through that illusion, the logical thing is find somebody you appreciate and ask for more from them. But this is, a, this is a new awareness. Okay, get it. it. You got it just then, but get that nobody had this for thousands of years. This planet, we're monkeys. Well, what's, what's the thinking there? The thinking is uh, if you appreciate life, you don't ask for more. You should just be happy with what you've got. Which, you know, there's certain benefits to that too. I, I'm thinking of Crosby, Steals, and Nash, their song, Love the One You're With. I totally love the one I'm with. I get that, but... But it's not based upon I'm content, I'm accepting, not I'm just settling. Although settling by itself is a very important concept if your expectations are too high. 
if they're too high, you have to settle for what you get. Appreciate what you have is the key and want more. Well, that sounds interesting. I wrote a book on that. What's the name of that book? Let's go. How to get more in your life and want what you have. So you got to want what you have. You got to appreciate what you have and get more. Nothing wrong with that. But see, this is a complicated idea. A monkey cannot comprehend that. If I have what I want, then I don't want more. It's only if I'm hungry do I want more. It's only if I'm missing do I want more. As opposed to how about wanting more if you have just what you need. And, and that's why I also focus on how important it is to get what we need. Because if you're, whenever you're coming from lack and you're wanting more from a place of lack, you will continue to get lack. You will get more and more. Just the same thing. If we want to create peace in the world and we use war to create peace, then that's our formula. So in order to sustain peace, we have to creating war, creating war. <laughs> if makeup sex, if the only time you have great sex is after fighting a battle, that's called makeup sex, which is quite good. Uh, makeup sex after a big argument and everything, <laughs> then you have great sex. I mean, it is great. Why? But you have to keep have creating fights in order to have great sex. Why is that? Well, when it comes to makeup sex and why that's so good, is because usually it's in makeup sex where couples will express how they feel. They're no longer lying. They're no longer omitting. They're no longer denying. They're getting it out there. They're expressing what's there. They're being authentic. And so that just gets it all out there. And then what's behind that? All those lies is keeping me from shining. See here, what does a lie do? What is a mask? What is a cover up? What is deception? And, you know, I just get so tired of everybody saying conspiracy people. You know, there's right and wrong. Everything in the government has been conspiracy. We know the CIA keeps everything secret. <laughs> conspiracy means people are secretly conspiring to achieve goals, okay? It's a secret. Well, we know that there's top secret. This is top secret. This is top secret. They're saying it right in front of you. Right in front of you, they're saying, we're lying to you. You, Whatever we say, we have permission to lie to you. We lie, we lie, we lie. Well, that's top secret. We can't tell you that. Therefore, we're omitting it. We're not letting you know the whole truth. John F. Kennedy, before they murdered him two weeks before, gave a great speech and where he said there are secret societies in this world. We have to eliminate all secret societies. We need transparency. Only in transparency can this world grow. And only in transparency in our relationships can we have lasting love. And women, only in transparency can you find love, lower stress, and sleep at night. But transparency doesn't mean that you, you, that you express everything to everyone. What you do is you find the appropriate expressions of the truth. If something is not gonna, if something's gonna hurt someone, don't do that until you can find a way to express your truth in a way that doesn't hurt. But you can express your truth to somebody else and it's not going to hurt them. So here what you have is, is uh, say you're angry with your husband. Don't go get angry with him and tell him you're angry with him. That means you're not loving. All negative emotions are not loving. They come from a loving person. They come from a person who wants to love and be loved. But what they are is somehow, somewhere inside of you, you stop being loving. That's what a negative emotion is. And now these more superficial ones, little, those are the cortisol negative emotions, anger, sadness, fear, rage, outrage, scared, shame, guilt, all that. That's the big stuff. That's all very primitive stuff coming out of here. Not loving at all. Comes from a person who wants to love and love, but you've stopped. If you can just get your negative emotions, you stop loving. Now, the answer isn't to suppress that. The answer is to transform that. You've got to cook it. You've got to, you know, you, it's like raw vegetables for some people will cause irritability in the gut. You've got to cook them. Then you can, then you can digest them. Or you got to chew your food. Otherwise, you can't digest it. You got to chew it and chew it and chew it. You can tell I'm fasting. I'm talking about food a lot. Chew, 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 chew. Break it down 
So what you have to do with negative emotions, you got to chew on them. You got to break them down. You got to transform them into something that can be received by the body. You transform your negative emotions into positive emotions and the journey to doing that. And that is the journey for women more so than men. Men, you've got to transform your actions. That's what men have to do. And we only do that by feedback, loving feedback. Loving feedback changes men's action, women. Punishment doesn't. This is, there's Harvard studies, big university studies. <clears throat> I'm embarrassed I have to quote Harvard because everybody looks at Harvard as this big acknowledgement when, when also I know Harvard is filled with lies and deceptions and whatever. It's ma massive manipulation goes on there in terms of the biases and what they teach and the histories they teach and so forth. But it is a lot of great, brilliant people there and a lot of wisdom there. So I'm not gonna, so I, I just use that as a credible credibility thing. But if you know anybody who's uh, graduated from Harvard, it's only, it only takes 60 seconds before in every conversation, they'll mention they went to Harvard. But why not, you know, if, it, if, if you got it, flaunt it, whatever it is. But from my point of view, uh, just because somebody goes to Harvard or whatever they've done, it doesn't give them wisdom. And that's what the world needs now. Smarts is smart, and we need smarts, but there's so many smart people and they have no wisdom or little wisdom. Hmm. Oh, we've already gone over an hour. So, the Woman's Guide, I'm going to summarize this talk today, then I'm going to look at your questions. So get your questions ready, and let's see what we got here, and I'll see if I can go back over some of the questions too. But the, uh, and maybe, Helena, if you've been reading these, you could write some questions that people have. You could copy and paste them for me. That could be a good system for us, is uh, what you could do is you could take people's questions in the comment section when I'm talking and put them on a Word doc and then when we're ready for the question and answer session, you could copy them from your Word doc right over into the comment section. And I can address people's questions based on this talk. That would be very helpful. So, you know, I wanted to talk today about alpha women, why they're alone. Well, one of the reasons they're alone, stressed or can't sleep. Okay, they're alone because when you're a woman on your male side, you're not making estrogen. You can't fall in love if you can't make estrogen. Period. You can't have wonderful orgasms. You can create this, some can masturbate and create this kind of orgasmic state, but it's never satisfying. Uh, I have a very funny story about that, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Anyway, so, <clears throat> and I wanted to finish up another story. I'll do that in the question and answer. Uh, another very funny story where I got that distinction about women and men's happiness and why men feel controlled by the way men feel controlled because when we cannot when what we do doesn't make you happy then we have to adjust our behavior and adjust our behavior and it seems like nothing we do makes you happy unless we give up who we are so there's a lot of sacrifice that men make that doesn't get rewarded and so then we feel controlled Ironically, you can control me if you give me a big reward. I don't mind being controlled as a man. It's really more about we're not getting our reward for what we did. Uh, that's the primary need for men is to feel uh, appreciated for what they do. To be accepted is not having to be perfect and still appreciated and to still be trusted as doing our best and our best is good enough. One thing is the trust that he's doing is that, that he cares about you and loves you. So many women just go, oh, I can't trust him now. I can't trust him. Um, he just doesn't love me. I'm not that important to him. Over the littlest things, that, instead of just saying, well, I can't always trust him to go to the speed limit, but I trust that he cares about me. And I trust that if I, if I put my hand up like this, that was by a signal, he'll slow down because he loves me and he cares about me. As opposed to going up, oh, he's going so fast. He knows I don't like that. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me. So women go to <laughs> doubting love, trusting, not trusting, and so forth. This is all or nothing phenomena. It's very common for both men and women. Men go into all or nothing when it comes to caring. I just don't care. F you. And, and women go, I can't trust you. I'll do it myself. I'll emphasize that again. 
This is what we do. Men go into F you. I don't care. I don't give a shit. I don't give a damn. I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to do. And we sink down. And, and women and women go into, I can't trust you. You don't love me. You don't care about me. I can't. I have to. I, I, I've asked so many times. I'm, I'm not going to ask anymore. I don't need you. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. <laughs> and the, the heart is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So now we see even more women with more heart disease. So th these are our challenges. Um, <clears throat> so in, in, in summary, uh, for women who are more on their male side, why is it they live shorter lives, they have more heart attacks, they're more stressed? <clears throat> why is it they're alone? They're stressed because when you're on your male side and you're not making enough female hormones, your cortisol levels go up. It interferes with all your health functions. You're alone. Why you can't fall in love again is because you can't fall in love because it takes a lot of estrogen to fall in love. Easier to fall in love when you're a teenager because you have so much estrogen. And then you stop trusting. You stop appreciating. You stop accepting. You start demanding perfection. You start feeling disappointed and feeling you have to do it yourself. You stop trusting, you know, and all of these things come from not the outer world that I harped on today. It's our own feelings of inadequacy inside. Men only say I stop caring because what I do doesn't work. I guess I'm just not good enough. Although they don't always admit that. And women go into, well, I just can't trust anybody ultimately because something's wrong with me. I don't deserve to be loved. And they don't admit that. Some do admit it, but most people uh, who think they have high self-esteem go, oh no, I am good enough. Or, oh, I do deserve it. We deserve it. We deserve it. We're powerless victims. Using your victimness for power is not, not a formula that works in a civilized world. And we have to wake up to that. We wake up to it in our daily basis. And particularly by going on dates if you're single. Right away, everybody should be on dates if they're single. And if you're married, start taking responsibility for your happiness and give up blame blaming, give up complaining, give up trying, give up demanding your partner to make changes in order for you to be happy. And the summary of this whole thing is the way you sleep better at night and get the rest and rejuvenation you need. You've got to lower your stress. And you, the way you lower your stress is through love, not alone. You need support. You need help. So at a time where women are more independent than ever, they need help more than ever. And what kind of help do they need? They need the help to come back to their female side. And yes, other women can help you without a doubt. But the most powerful thing is to find a man to help you. And, and even if you're gay, find a man to help you. You need to connect with that masculine energy and that you're trusting a man. Just imagine if you're in a gay relationship because you don't trust men. You don't trust half the world. You cut yourself off from half the world. You need to start dating or you need to start befriending men, depending on men, opening up to men, revealing who you are to men. Because you can do it to women. That's practice. That's good practice. And then go on dates. That's good practice. Uh, and go to a coach. Our Mars Venus coaches are really great at this. Go to them. Go take Lauren's courses, how to get our me time. It's all about learning how to set healthy boundaries, how to ask for what you want and get it from men, how to give yourself what you need, what you need. Different times of the month, you have different needs. And on the biological level, the basic level, Rx for women at MarsVenus.com. It will start helping you right away, balance your hormones. Myomin, another uh, <clears throat> Chinese herbal mixture, will help you start balancing your hormones, reduce the <clears throat> stress response inside of you. <clears throat> Lithium orotate, super minerals for women, so powerful for lowering your stress levels, balancing the dopamine and serotonin levels in your brain. <clears throat> and so... <clears throat> And superfood shakes, which is not only will they help you lose weight, but they will, if you're overweight, but they will provide you the pre-digestive proteins to produce dopamine and serotonin in the brain in a balanced way. <clears throat> so with these new insights, <coughs> if you're an alpha woman, you can learn to find love again. 
you can lower stress in your lives and you'll sleep better. So thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you. From my heart to you, I wish you always the opportunities to grow in love and the ability to live a lifetime of happiness and success. So now I'm going to shift gears. <clears throat> that was about an hour and a half. Uh, focusing on ideas in a new book I'm going to write. And uh, now I'm going to go back over. I'm going to skip. You know, my computer doesn't go back all the way to the beginning of my questions. So when, I, when I'm live, at least. So I'm going to start with what shows up here. John, through, this is from Bonnie. Through your personal stories, you and Bonnie have helped my husband and me during our soulmate seminar a decade ago. Your willingness to openly share has helped so many. Going masculine for me was a form of protection, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was traumatized in childhood. Oh, this is such a great share, and I hope other people can do this, helping us to see through your experiences some of the things I'm talking about. It makes such a difference, as well as the insights that you glean the validation of these ideas. Thank you so much for sharing this. Going masculine for me was a form of protection and I didn't know I was doing it. See, it's all automatic. It's, this is the automatic reaction when we're out of balance. When life tips you over, women tend to tip to the male side, men tip to the female side. Now, it wasn't always this way. This is a, stink, a distinction that's very interesting. When women were never allowed to go to their male side, Okay. They didn't go over there. They didn't have this problem, but then they created another problem, which is then they would have, if you literally can't do it yourself because the laws and the community and so forth, which were there to try to help you and at one stage of evolution from becoming men and helping men to not become women like they are now. And we'll see when men become women, just to put a distinction here, they become, de they become highly dependent. They become alcoholics. They become porn addicts. They become violent. They become, they demand respect. They become demanding. They become, you know, this is what happens to men when they become feminized. Uh, whereas for women, they become too masculine. So the idea was cultures around the world historically figured this out to survive and it seemed logical and a good thing. Let's make it so that women don't have that uh, ability to go over to their male side. Let's try to keep them over on the female side and keep men over on the male side. Don't let them go over to the female side at all. When men should never cry, never be upset, should never whine and complain, you should do the dirty, dangerous, you know. And so basically, let's get men over there, women over there. And suddenly, uh, we're outgrown that, you see. And some people outgrew that before the rest of us. And so then, for example, women who felt you know, we need to vote, we need to vote. Other women were saying, yeah, we don't need to vote. We're busy making our children. Our husbands are doing a good job. You know, why I have to make all the decisions? I'll leave it to my husband. I'm busy, I'm pregnant, I'm breastfeeding. I, I don't know the right person to pick. Why not? So, you know, it's a distinction there. So many women were for not voting, uh, but many women were outgrowing that. They're the forerunners. They're outgrowing only being feminine. They wanted to go to the masculine side. Oh, bummer, I just lost... Oh, I talked too long. I'm so sorry. I couldn't hear the rest of your comment. Maybe, Helena, you could copy that last one and figure out how to copy it and post it. Uh, so Yastra says, if she asks for help and the man refuses to help her, she loses trust in him. Is he in his distorted masculine side? No, maybe she asked for too much. Maybe she asked in a negative way. Maybe she was demanding. Maybe she was critical. You know, the whole art of asking, last week I talked about the art of how to ask for help. First, you have to help ask within yourself. The second thing is you have to know how to ask him and you have to understand a man's refusal to do what you ask. Okay, so, and men have to learn how to language his refusal as well. But there's, there's such a great story I have on that. And, and Let's see, if you navigate away from the screen, the video life will end. Do you want to end? No. Um, my head moves back and forth because I got a camera right in front of the screen <laughs> that I'm looking at. Okay, so how to ask, meaning there's something called grumbles that men will have, and it's not a dysfunctional man. It's a man you haven't trained to do things for you and get big rewards. 
So he's, he's normally, we are trained by culture and women. Hey, you want a diamond ring? Hey, you want a house? You want a guy who's got a job who makes money? And the guys who look out in the world, the guys who make the most money get the prettiest girls, you know? So this is like the, the dynamic of our world today. Men are trained every day. You have to do more in order to be loved. Okay, so that's it. So if you're going to ask him to do something little, you want to make sure he gets a big reward. He needs to be trained that little things make a big, big deal out of it. Uh, so what has happened so massively on Asura, the biggest disaster in history? You know, I'm not getting, I'm not sure what's my comments. I'm sorry. If I talk, I lose your comments. So then now I'm just going to read them all the way through. Uh, Natty says, I think that so. this is when a man is feeling powerless himself and somehow. Not all men are just, men do not want to just be servants, okay? There's a dignity to masculinity. We have to feel that we're making the decision to do it. You give us the problem and we solve it. So here's a man joining in. Men are welcome to this for women only conference here. If you fall in love with a woman, which just as you said basically means you're kneeling to her, then how would you balance that with your role as her husband, keeping in mind family systems as an institution? What's the problem there? It, that's the whole point. We're mutually supporting each other. And how do we support? Is you're selfless in the way you support primarily. Your male side is about you serving her. Her female side is about her appreciating you by receiving your service. See, that's the dynamic. This whole idea of man is boss. I'm talking about... Yes, absolutely. Yield to the man's decision-making ability. But men need to respect how a woman feels. And women have to find an ability to appreciate what he says and at the same time point out what you would like and what you wish and let him know why you would like that. And then it's up to him. But you see, men become this, this dysfunctional being where they're demanding and they're not taking you into consideration when they're not feeling appreciated or if he's tired you know men have the cave time thing you know guys you, today you don't want to take your cave time a woman says well we need to be together well he's not going to do that he needs to respect himself as well so what he can do he has to learn languaging for this and you have to learn understanding okay if you're going to spend time watching tv when you when you're done would you help me that's how you do it what women do that why are you sitting on the TV? I'll just do it myself. As opposed to, oh, honey, I see you're tired and you're working on the TV. Let me uh, just click on comments and you'll see all of them. Okay. Okay, so click on comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I click on comments. I just comment moderation, not set. Uh, Oh, only comments over 100 characters will be shown. Comments will only be able to connect every 10 seconds. Only your followers will be able to leave comments restricted, protected. Okay, I still don't see how I can have all of the comments show. I just have a bunch of, I only have like five comments on the left side. Uh, I click on comments. I don't get a whole page of comments. Okay, so um, anyway, sorry about that, folks. I don't know. I'll have to figure this one out. Sure, clearly there's a way I can do it or why my computer's not to. Oh, okay, so I can roll down, but I can't roll up is the problem. Okay, so maybe I'm losing it. I'm, I'm thinking reverse. Okay, so this is, all right, I get it. I can reach all my comments if I just keep going down, I think. Two minutes, three minutes ago, 13 minutes ago. No, I can't. See, the whole thing about life and why we don't get life is we don't have the instructions. So I will uh, do as I can here with you folks today. Um, Helena says, post your comments here. Please don't spam. Somebody says, okay. Amazing. Cortisol makes women go away from their female side and men go away from their masculine side. Nicely summarized. Feminine says, Help me. That's feminine power. Never thought that asking for help was because I was powerful. I thought it was a sign of weakness.
but it's true. Men want to serve and provide stress responses. Oh my goodness, I fix like a man. I say, I just fixed it. Why is it coming back again? I fixed it. That's men going, why, if I fixed her emotions, why is she upset again? Why is she upset again? Now you understand, I did it. Amazing show today, John, thank you. Jael, thank you so much for that acknowledgement. If a man wants to make an alpha woman happy, he has to be a man, not only a male. All right, let's clear that up, Yasra. Okay, what does it mean to be a quote, man versus a male? Oh, this, this, this is, women all the time say, I want a real man. Okay, this is like, it's true. You, you, a, a male is a man. What you want is a man who is respectful, a man who is understanding, a man who is caring and considerate. You also want a man who takes care of himself before he gives to you. You want a man who doesn't whine and complain. You want a man who doesn't depend on you for his self-esteem, but his self-esteem is enhanced through you. You want a man with a job. You want a man who doesn't depend on you or need you except your happiness. That's what a real man is. You want a man who doesn't get angry with you. And if he is angry, he doesn't act out, but becomes quiet and takes time to process it or learns how to be a good listener so that that will dissipate his anger if he can figure out where you're coming from. But many times men can't. So that's what it means to be a man. And there's wonderful books on being a man, by the way, which will say wonderful things like that. Not that you're, uh, he's rooted in himself. He's grounded in himself. He's not dependent on you for his sense of self. Often women go, oh, you don't love me. You don't need me. If you're not jealous that I'm doing this and this, then you're not a real man. No. Jealousy is, is first of all, it's, Overly feminized man is jealous, one. Two, uh, a jealous woman is just in her monkey self and she needs to outgrow that. But a jealous man's really out there. You know, the real test of masculinity has put this test forth, men, which is if your partner, if you are unable to provide your partner with the sexual fulfillment she needs for whatever reason, you would be happy for her to have another man provide that for her. And you could even watch it. Just get that. That's what it's like to be a real man. No jealousy, no whining, no, no fear. And if you have those fears, you process them alone. And doesn't it make sense if I can't satisfy my wife sexually that I would want her to find that? And vice versa, women, what does it mean to be a loving woman? If you can't satisfy your husband sexually, then honey, let me find a woman who can satisfy you. That would be your job to do. Just take that in. That's what love is. Shouldn't, shouldn't have to uh, control somebody from fulfilling their basic needs. And sexuality is a basic need for both men and women. Women are not aware of it as much, but men are. And to deny that need because we have a society that says, well, if your wife doesn't provide, you should, you can't find it somewhere else. It's, it's like saying you have to, I have to fast the rest of my life to be healthy and spiritual. Well, that's not fun. Just thought I'd bring up those thoughts. I think she'll not be able to appreciate him as much, says Muhammad. All, all, the, all media requests. See, it's not like men are just, we want you to be happy, but we have to take care of ourselves first. We have ourselves. We have to do what we think is right. We have to make decisions on our own. You give us the information. We're the decider. We respect your feelings. We respect your thoughts. We respect your wishes and wants. We want to hear those. We make the decision. So what is romance? My favorite romance technique. Women, your job every week. Tell your husband next week, honey, these are three things I would love to do that will feel romantic to me. Not that you have to already know. That's monkey cuckoo-ness. That's, that's adolescence. You have to learn how your power to ask for and get what you want and need and then appreciate it. Not feel that, oh, if I have to ask for it, it doesn't count. Oh, 
one of the biggest deals that women go through, not all women, of course, whenever I say these things, there's just so many women. They say, oh, if I have to ask, then he doesn't love me. And yeah, it certainly feels much, much better without a doubt. You know, I know how to get a standing ovation in an audience by setting it up. Even in my mind, I know I'm asking for it and I don't even like that. But if I don't get applause, you know, I used to do this for years, which I would say, now, if you love my talk, let me know with your clapping. And, and that felt really good. But then I got to this thing where I could learn how to say things. So everybody would clap. And then that, that was felt good for a while. And then I said, I don't want to have to do things. I want people just to spontaneously clap. That's, that's without my trying. That feels the best. No doubt about it, that feels the best. But if I give a talk and nobody claps, I say, now, if you appreciate my talk, let me know with your clapping. I'm going to get my basic needs met. And sometimes it's orgasmic where you get a, a non-solicited standing ovation. Uh, that's wonderful, but not necessary for my happiness. That's just wonderful. That's happier. Salina says, all media requests for John can be sent to events at marsvenus.com. Michelle says, so powerful in today's political and social world. G is, G is very good. Yes, it is. Uh, rest in peace. I'm non-demanding. I've left my man in his cave since Saturday. Now, Natty, good to do. Leave him in his cave, but don't let him stay too long. Okay, this is the key. Men get comfortable in their cave. Men should never get too comfortable. That's his female side. He's over in his cave. Uh, basically, cave is like men get to do what they enjoy doing. So I haven't really talked much about this, but this really, it's a man going over to his female side. So why, if a man goes to his female side, is he going to produce more testosterone? Why can't he just go to his wife and have a conversation and, and uh, produce his, go, go to his female side? And the answer for that is that when he goes to his wife or his children, He's going to go too far to his female side where he's, he's actually dependent on your approval. He's dependent on your appreciation. He's dependent on your uh, trusting him and thinking he's your hero. He, that's what we fall in love with women. When we're kneeling, we're depending on you to say, yes, you're my hero. You're the great guy. So that's our female side. We're yielding to you. You see, there's a little trick here. I, it's a little complicated, so I don't always talk about it, but actually the cave is where a man gets to do things that make him happy, but he does it without going too far to his female side, okay? And he has to do things at the same time. So they're challenging activities, challenging activities where he's dependent on something else to make him feel good. Okay, so when I'm working hard, I'm not depending on anything to feel good. I'm depending on me. I'm doing my thing. I'm making a difference. I'm depending upon the outcome of what I do to feel good. Okay, but cave time is where you're not depending on the outcome of what you do uh, to feel good so much. So it's kind of easy. It's like playing a game, a challenge, driving your car, uh, playing a uh, meditating, e e easy things to do, working out in a gym or whatever, doing things for yourself. That's, that's a guy's cave time. So it's not dependent so much on the approval of somebody else, but you do it for yourself. But you have this female side energy, which is you get to enjoy it. So I'm doing it for myself, it's selfish activity, and I'm enjoying it. The problem with cave time is that you can get some of those benefits of cave time, but they also are destructive, which is you can go, to, go online and do porn, that's, that's for yourself, that's very pleasurable. It's too estrogen stimulating, one. And again, the other one, he gets a surge of testosterone, so it feels good to him. His testosterone's low, he gets a surge of testosterone, it feels good. But he also got all this estrogen, which then lowers it back down again. Anytime men ejaculate, the estrogen levels soar and it pushes their testosterone down. He can also uh, watch hours and hours of TV or the news or whatever. That will constantly produces dopamine, which raises his testosterone. So he's rebuilding his testosterone, but now he's creating a brain problem where his brain now becomes overly dependent upon high stimulation to produce testosterone. And now he, he can't make as much testosterone the next day. Are you, he doesn't produce as much testosterone anymore unless he has that high stimulation. 
So what we want is normal stimulation to stimulate testosterone in us. So cave time needs to be non-stressful, enjoyable activities for men uh, that don't produce super high levels of dopamine. A video game uh, is on one level not stressful to the conscious mind. Adrenaline is being produced the whole time. But a vi video game overstimulates dopamine in the brain. It turns to, it desensitizes dopamine receptors and now you're dependent upon it more and more and more. So these are addictive tendencies. Men become addictive. That's men going to their female side. And, and men have addictions when they don't feel good enough inside because they're not getting rewarded. They're not getting paid enough for what they do or what they, or they get, they get love for not doing anything, which is inheritance for many men. And not all men, okay, but that was, uh, Rockefeller wrote a book uh, about the sons of wealthy men because they all, they, they tend to become playboys, irresponsible, can't make a commitment, uh, play around all the time, uh, want to take drugs, now they're cocaine addicts, you know, this is all the party life. And nothing on that party, it's just the party life, okay, it's a different distinction. So let me come back to your questions here. Um, He's good. Uh, Natty says, I'm not demanding. So how do you, your man's in his cave. So man goes to his cave. That's the soft, he gets soft. You give him jobs to do. Honey, when you're, when you're over there, uh, when you, when you have time, I need your help. Um, oh, honey, you've been in the cave for several days. You know, when you come out, I'm, I let's, let's go spend time in the park. I want to go for a walk and I miss you. Okay. See, there's no demand with that, but there's a request non-demanding request. That's the secret with men. Great insights this morning and you're at your most charming today. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, have a great day, everyone. Hello from Perth, Australia. You're so awesome and sweet. Plandemic for sure. Uh, if you want to get what you want, uh, that's my book. Uh, so true. We often forget to appreciate what we have and enjoy. Greetings from Denmark. Thank you, Denmark. Denmark, a country, uh, I keep getting this wrong. And I, I love Denmark, by the way. I think it's one of the countries in that area, at least. Uh, might be Holland, not sure. But it's, uh, it was considered the happiest country in the world. And yet there's more single, there's all these single women and they're happy because the government supports them. I'm not in favor of that, okay? I'm in favor of not being so dependent on the government. You know, I'll, I'll just tell you how, when you extend things out, when you, um, when, it, when it's easy for women to suck the tit of the government, you don't need a man in your life. And it's only when women need men in their lives that they come back to their female side. And it's only when men feel needed that they come back to their male side. So we're kind of destroying men by letting women get everything they need from the government. Now, I'm, I'm also for helping poor people. They need help, they need assistance without a doubt. We need to care for everybody like our children and we have to think of them as like children and help them. But we have to compensate and realize that people live by incentives. And so if we're gonna give single women help, we need to give married couples more help. Because the reason single women are single is because they didn't get help when they were married. That's the key. So there should be massive tax incentives and, and more incentives if you take classes on relationships and so forth that have a proven record of keeping people together. There should be huge amounts of funds going into that. We, that would solve all of our problems today if mothers and fathers loved each other and children grew up in happy families. That is the biggest problem. It's the cause of war. That's the cause of addiction. That's the cause of disease. That's the cause of... Um, economic imbalance in the world, all the problems all come from uh, our hearts are closed. And as, as you know, we don't correct things in evolution until evidently, evidently, until things get really bad. And things are getting really, really bad, which is divorce rates are up, up, up. Uh, the amount of single people is double, which shows that it's even worse than divorce rates going high is people who can't even love each other long enough to get married. They fall in love. People are still dating and enjoying each other and so forth, but they're not falling in love. They're not able to stay in love enough to get married. And once they're married, they can't stay in love and they try again. And 
it goes up to 60, 70 percent, 80 percent, 90 percent if the third marriages get divorced. And this is just failure, failure, failure. So why not just be single? Have lots of friends. That's a need. That's nothing wrong with that. No problem with that. But you're missing out. And it's a sign of imbalance and a sign of problems. Relationship is what life is about. And particularly if you're going to have responsibility of children, you should stay together and raise those kids together. And if you can't, because you pick the wrong person, they're just not willing to grow, you can't control somebody else's destiny and who they are, then you get a divorce, but you make sure that those both parents are participating in that child's life. You do everything you can so that you harmoniously participate with that person. And quite often, good fences make good neighbors. Sometimes a good divorce can allow you to be friends with each other as well. So now you're friends with your ex and you're a woman, what do you need to do? <clears throat> What you tend to do is just take care of your little children and feel like, oh, now I got to do it all myself. No, you go find another man so those children get to see that you're not depending on them for your happiness, but you've got somebody else you can depend on for your happiness. Nothing worse than a mother who depends on her children for her happiness. She's giving such a burden to those kids, such a, such a push down for those children. If you want to give your children the greatest women, you want to give them the message that you know, some men, you know, th that men are wonderful, men are good. Your father's a wonderful man. We just weren't right for each other, period. And so we brought out the worst in each other. You know, sometimes we can just be in a situation and it brings out the worst in us. But now I have someone, another man, and he makes me feel really good. I'm really grateful he's in my life. Or I'm having other men, whatever you, if you're just in a series of dating. So true. We often forget to appreciate what we have. Thank you from Denmark, where also the rate of alcoholism, drug addiction is, I think it's legal there. <laughs> so, so we don't see it as a problem. So I, I did a whole paper on this and I put it in one of my books, this Beyond Mars and Venus, and they took it out. Because I wanted to point out how we measure happiness is not marriage, success in marriage. And it wasn't a freedom from drug addiction. It was giving free drugs out to people. Uh, although one of the things I do like about Scandinavian countries, one of them is that health insurance does pay for prostitutes for men who can't, who are, have disabilities in some way, so they're satisfied sexually. There needs to be uh, an availability of sexuality for men who, for whatever reason, are not able to have a sexual partner. And women, there are certain women that be very happy to be like angels to help these men. They exist and, and it feels good to them. But then even better, I'll tell you what I did with the prisoners at San Quentin who all are completely males, completely shut down to any feelings at all, okay, because their mothers were so unhappy. They couldn't make their mothers happy. And so all their, their, there's so much pain, so much pain. And then they act out that pain by causing pain to others because they can't feel it within themselves. It's a big story when I go to that, but the, the reality here is the way I healed them was I brought women in, not as prostitutes, but as, the, as clients, and let the men, prisoners, be therapists to them, which is, they would go into, women would go into being like little, I put them in aggression to childhood, and then they talk to their fathers, and I would tell the men what to say. Tell me, help me understand that better. You're feeling angry, what else? Tell me more, tell me more what you're sad about. And these men got to experience the depth of women's pain without having to inflict pain. You see, it's like, if you can't feel somebody else's pain, you can't feel it within yourself if you're a man. That's how we grow in our femininity is by being there for women as men, our female side emerges. It's a profound concept. Nobody teaches this at all. A man grows in his female qualities by being there for a woman, by making her happy or being supportive in her pain and that's how he grows in awareness of his own female side. And if you have pain inside of yourself, men, you will tend to be attracted to a woman who has the same pain inside of her so that you can be there for her. And being there for her, you will find your own pain. If she doesn't allow you to go to that place or you don't know how to bring her to that place, then you will go into your own pain and you'll be a big victim. And you'll then suddenly fall into the monkey trap of powerlessness gives you power, which is this negativity that runs our society. It shouldn't be the squeaky wheel gets the attention. Um, your shows are so much appreciated. Thanks for your sharing your thoughts, insights. Love to watch you from my couch. Oh good, so true. Top secrets 
should never be a part of a democratic culture. I agree. Hi, Teresa. Saw you there. I'm from Sydney. Welcome. Is that my wellness guide? Also for those basic things, hormone balance, better sleep, blood sugar balance, losing weight. Great book there, free wellness guide. There's a link to it. This is a very good book. I bought one a few years ago. It's true that communication has been and is and will always be number one problem if not taken care of. Absolutely. And you know, when people kind of go with the basic communication skills, I'm telling you, you can do some of the basic communication skills that you teach in communication 101. Active listening, for example, a great skill only creates arguments for most couples because they don't know how to manage their male female feelings. You say, so what I hear you saying is you're being a big bitch and you, <laughs> and you can't appreciate anything I say. <laughs> that doesn't really work, does it? Or what you say is, I understand you're feeling unhappy because this is this. No, that's not what I feel. You never get it the way I, that's not what I said. Couples will get into it no matter what communication skills they have. If you don't take personal responsibility for what's going on inside of you, then communication skills, if they're good, can work. And sometimes even without good communication skills, if you're coming from a place of love, pretty much it works. And I know you might be thinking, but I'm trying to help my partner all the time because I love him. No, you're manipulating him. You can think, you can feel like love when it's not love. You can be caring for a man at the same time you don't trust. You say, oh, I'm worried about you. I'm concerned. You should eat this and this and this. And then you'll be healthy. That feels like love. You're poisoning him because you're not trusting him to be a grown man and make his own decisions. If he hasn't asked for that dietary advice, stop giving it. Giving unsolicited advice, men, women, you don't want him to give you advice. He don't want your advice. Particularly women don't want men to give advice when women are talking about their feelings. Don't tell me how I should feel. Don't tell me my feelings are wrong. Don't correct my feelings. Instead, hear me, try to understand me. And it says, I got it. I've been... It's been raining all day in UK. I'm in my hot tub with headphones on listening to you now. Yay, UK. <laughs> Will this be recorded? Yes, these talks are all recorded on Facebook Live at my website, John Gray, Mars Venus. We do have these recorded and they're available for you. Um, this is a very good book. I have one in my library. It's good communication. Thank God it's going on and on. And I'm loving it. But AI... Have to go. Bye bye. Uh, how should I deal with my negative reaction to a man's looking at me with disdain, disgust, ridicule, and response to a question I've asked? Basically, very short and walk away if you can. Okay, so he, he looks like you're asking me one more time. And probably you are asking too much, by the way. You want to reflect on how you ask, how often you ask, and are you appreciating enough? the things he does do for you. So if you're asking for more, which most people do, most women, when you ask, you're coming from a place of many, many moons of dissatisfaction. I call that the alphabet theory. Let's say the first time you ask and you've never been disappointed, that's, a, that's an A. And your tone of voice will be, oh, hey, would you pass this salt? Oh, by the way, when you open the store, would you pick it up for me? Or, oh, this is like my favorite thing, would you do that? These are all like level A. Then you get to B and C, D, E. How many disappointments you've had along the way until the tone of voice changes to X, Y, Z, which is, <laughs> would you do this for me at, le at least this time? Would you try to remember how many times I have to ask you? I can't do this all myself. Would you at least try one time? Would you give it to me? See, this is a tone of voice. And you don't have to say those words. Your tone of voice collects over time. Disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. So you can use the right words. His disgust, his disdain is not you're asking so many times. It's you ask and it's never enough to make you happy. And that's where that's coming from. Now, your job is to be happy. And it does hurt when you get that stuff. So what you do is you recognize, I created this. He created it, no doubt. It's awful what he did. It's terrible, awful. But at the same time, you trained him. You created it because you're not happy. You're not happy. You got to get, you're making his behavior, your happiness depended on his behavior. But you ask me, what do you do when you get that? 
immediately go, he, inside you go, <laughs> he is such a child. Now that's in your mind, okay? And he's so hurt in your mind. That's a kind of an understanding and an acceptance. But what you do is you go right into, uh, he's ridiculed and says, all right, you know, let's, I, I actually, I kind of need the phrase he would use to give you the exact phrase, but it would be, I don't know, and then walk away. Another one was, huh, I have to think about that and walk away. Or, I didn't think that was funny and walk away. Uh, maybe this is the wrong time and walk away. Some kind of comment, <laughs> short, three or four words and walk away. Just don't entertain it and recognize now my feelings are hurt because I took that personally. It's not about me. You see, that's your issue. It's, it, it becomes more about you as soon as you react to it and say anything. Okay, Any, you, you got to take time to walk away and go, why am I taking that personally? And realize it didn't just start with him. This is your childhood feelings of taking things personally. This is where somebody mistreated you as a child, ignored you as a child, and you felt something was wrong with you and you didn't deserve to be loved. And so there's the whole healing the heart process you've got to do with this. And you know the story I told a couple of weeks ago, such a good story, I've been telling it lately, everybody loves it, about the monk who you know, was taking things personally, you know, which has become our society. We are a victim society. Safe zones is absurd. This is ridiculous. Everybody's taking offense. I, I, I'm offended. I'm offended. <laughs> taking just awful, awful, awful. And so uh, what happens is you have to recognize to take offense is to offend. If he does that to you, you are offending him back and he's been offended by your attitude over and over. And so he just throws it at you without you even being offended. It, he already knows you'll be offended and he feels offended by that. <laughs> Just see the logic of that. So what we have to do is recognize we are taking things personally as an adult. I'm taking things personally. That means I'm not yet an adult. That's a part of me that's still working on growing up. So you go back to that part of you. And the more you engage in talking to him, the more you use the victimness of that to get empathy and sympathy, the stronger that reaction is going to be inside of you. You need to take responsibility to go to a child who deserves, who has the right to be upset about that. Don't make me wrong. You're being mean to me. It's your fault. You're the parent. I'm not responsible for this. You're bad. I'm not. You sh I'll forgive you if you apologize. And then they apologize to you and they understand your feelings. You go through your anger, your sadness, your fear, your regret, your guilt, your shame, your feelings of unworthiness. Go into what a child would have felt if somebody had asked you what you felt. Maybe you don't know that you felt that way. Every child does if you ask them what they're feeling and you already know from within yourself that you would feel that way if you were a child. See, there has to be a safety for you to go to that place. Uh, otherwise, people don't even know they're upset. They, they don't even know that, that they're mad. You know, they just feel sad. You know, we've covered that when somebody's like defensing and arguing and you say to them, you know, right now you're afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm pissed off at you. Well, you are pissed off, but underneath that you're afraid. And you're only afraid when you feel powerless. And you only feel powerless because you're not in touch with your true self. You feel inadequate. You feel unworthy. You feel limited and restricted. We all do this. This is not just you I'm talking about. This is everybody. This is the world we live into. You know, what I started out today, denials, rejections, and blames, and rage and the funny lady who said that, and the best is yet to come <laughs> you know just which is you know people stand up there they steal good cliches from good speakers you know anyway all right i remember i was i saw my dad today and and oh, i remembered him he would watch political speeches and they're so poetic they're so well written they're just so so flowery and everything. You got who writes that stuff? It's amazing. And my dad used to get so mad watching the TV. Say, it's all rhetoric. It's all rhetoric. They're all lies. And he and I didn't know what he was talking about. I just thought as a kid, sounds good to me. You know, sounds good to me. It all sounds so good. But when you know what's behind it, it's all blame and it's it's denial. It's um, it's um, 
all the things I talked about today. It's not telling you the whole picture, not telling you a whole picture to manipulate you and so forth. Um, hey, John, good to see you again. I've been on Mars Venus Counselor as well as workshop facilitator Steve Mandel, and we met on many occasions in the early 2000s. Hey, Steve, and everybody should know I'm Mars Venus Coaching. Uh, he's a, a Mars Venus coach. He's also a counselor. He's a, um, he has a, um, workshops. You know, we teach people how to give Mars Venus workshops. If you want to have fun, give workshops. Maybe you only have five people, ten people. They're fun uh, to talk about this stuff. The more you talk about it, the more you imbibe it in your life, and you help some people along the way. It's not going to make you millions of dollars. You know, that, that have your own career, but uh, you can also do this part time. Some people do very well with it, though, but that's their sort of mission and destiny. But I think everybody, yeah, not everybody, but a lot of people who, who love this work would really love it even more and integrate it more. You integrate something when you share it and teach it, that's for sure. So thank you, Steve, for pointing that out. Zabrowski, don't take it personally, right? Helena says, all shows are recorded and posted right here so you can watch them anytime. Gee was I can listen to you for hours. Yeah, I can talk for hours, too. <laughs> It's, it's, although I had some interviews I have to go to right away, I think. Uh, what to do if a man has addiction problems? Can the woman help? What should she do if so? It's a big subject. How do you help an addicted husband? Big. Generally speaking, what you would instinctively do doesn't help. So how to help is first thing is stop doing what doesn't, what doesn't work. So what doesn't work is... Uh, Telling him what he's doing is wrong. Telling him what he should do. Trying to help him when he's not asking for your help just causes resistance to doing it on his own. Men want to do things on their own. So how, how do you motivate him without telling him what to do? Men don't want you to tell him what to do. Um, <clears throat> they want to make you happy, but they don't want you to tell him what to do. He wants to figure it out. He wants to be his present, his gift. But if you ask, you're not telling him what to do. So basically, you know, you don't say, uh, John, I'm going out, we're going out. Would you, would you uh, uh, put on your best outfits tonight? It would make me really happy. So you're not really telling him to do, you're asking him what to do. And, and when it comes to doing things for you, you could also say, uh, and you know, uh, my favorite suit you wear is that blue one, but that black one also looks great too. And you know, my favorite ties you have are this, this, and this, and let him pick from there. To always sort of create options. And also when you're getting dressed, you can do things like <laughs> black dress, white dress. He says, black dress. You go, okay. And <laughs> as opposed to often, the women will ask a man what to do, this or this, and he'll say, go right hand, you'll go left. Okay, I'll do left. This is like, why ask if you're going to do the opposite? And men always wonder if you're really asking me, you know, and if it's a little thing and if both are pretty much okay, go with what he suggests. He'll feel proud of you for the whole evening. So back to addiction problems. We don't want to be told what to do. And you look at how you contributed to that problem. And generally speaking, any man with an addiction problem, you're part of the problem. And so what you need to do is focus more on being happy in your life, not making your unhappiness because of his addiction, but finding happiness in your life and start asking him to do things for you uh, it, where you could then give him a real pos a more positive response because he's actually doing something for you. He needs encouragement and support in his life that he can make a difference. And... Uh, you know, in different situations, you know, one of the only things you can do is say, you know, I love you, I care about you, I feel you're the right guy for me, and uh, I just don't feel comfortable because when you drink, you become like this, and I know that's not really you, or I feel like, um, you know, I love you, I care about you, and I, I no longer feel you there with me when we have sex, or we stopped having sex, and my understanding of this is, you know, when you're doing porn all the time, you lose interest in your wife. You can check that out in John's books. But, you know, all I know is that I'm not feeling your attention anymore. I've, I've, I need to have a, a, a fulfilling sexual relationship. So we need to have a separation. 
and maybe when you give up porn, I'll consider coming back. But I see that as an obstacle to us. So there is places for ultima ultimatums where you love when you set a boundary and go away and just say, you know, this is a problem for me when you do this. It makes me feel this and this and this, and therefore I don't want to be around you. I can't be, I can't be around you when that happens. So that, that's called not telling a person you should do this because it's good for you. You say, what I need is for you to stop doing this because when you do it, this is how it makes me feel. And make sure it's about how it makes you feel that you don't feel safe around him, you don't feel sexual attraction, you feel he's disinterested in you, you feel that you're not getting what you need. And then he can make it, so, you know, that's my request is that you start giving me what I need and the safety I need. Now, if you can still drink and make me feel safe, if you can still look at online porn and have we have a great sex life, I have no problem with that. That's your choice to do. So there's a subtle distinction there of don't tell him what to do, but ask him to do something and let him know why you're asking, which is that when you do online porn, and make I feel this and this and this. And, and personally, I've noticed I don't feel very like you're really into me when we have sex or we really haven't had sex the way we used to have. And uh, I feel I could open my heart to you more if you weren't opening your heart to these other women. And, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that. All I know, it, this is how it affects me. There's a lot of different approaches to it where you have to use some creativity in every situation where you're not telling him he should do it for him, that what he's doing is morally bad, what he's doing is going to make him sick, what he's going to do. You could say, you know, if you're drinking too much and it's, I, you drink so much, I know it's going to affect your liver and I'm afraid you're going to die. So I wish, I, you know, I don't care whether you drink or not. It's just that I'm afraid of losing you. And every time I see you drink, I start to feel that way. And maybe if you drank less, I'd feel more comfortable. Would you consider it? Would you just try to consider it? Something like that. The gentle approach is the best way to do it. Our for women. Helena brought in some questions here. So you're saying that it's okay to state your feelings even if they're responding to something your man did that upset you. Yes, and how do you do it? You do it when you have a heart, open heart. That's the secret to this. That's the whole art of communication, which is if your partner did something that upset you, they stepped on your foot, you need to let them know they stepped on your foot. But how do you do it? Do you step on their foot? No. Do you make them feel bad? No. Do you get all upset at them? No. Do you punish them? No. What you do is you process your feelings about that. Then your heart is open. Then you come to them and you say, the other day, uh, I just want to talk to you. Just take a few minutes and I just want you to understand what's going on inside of me. And it's no big deal. And I just want to let it go. But talking about it helped me let it go. Is this a good time? Yeah. What man's going to say no to that? So I'm going to take a few minutes. This is a good time. And you've already gone through your feelings. You don't have to like unwind and explore them and everything while you're talking. If it's about him, you need to be brief. You need to be to the point. You need to have already processed it. Now you need to inform him that, you know, what happened is yesterday you stepped on my foot and quite often you step on my foot. Now, many times I know you don't step on my foot. I mean, you're amazing. You don't step on my foot. And I appreciate that a lot. But sometimes you forget and you step on my foot and it hurts. And uh, I feel like I'm not important. A whole, whole, whole bunch of feelings. And I know these feelings are tied into how I felt as a child. But in present time, what I feel is it hurts. I begin to feel like you don't love me. I'm not important to you. Why would you step on my foot when you know it hurts me? And, and but I, I realized this is not about you. This is about my childhood where my dad used to step on my foot or step on my mother's feet all the time or my mom used to step on my foot all the time. And I have all these feelings that come up and uh, I just want to share some of those feelings. And, you know, I feel angry and I, I'm going to just share it the way it comes up inside of me. But it's really coming from my childhood. That's one way. Or you can say, or what I felt about what I want to say to my mother is or what I want to say to my father is. You know, I'm angry you step on my foot. I'm angry you don't care about me. I'm angry I'm not important to you. I'm angry that you forget me and so forth. So these are all the stuff that comes up and I processed all that. But I wanted you to know that that's one of my trigger points is when you step on my foot and it does hurt a bit. And I just want you to consider this in the future if you can avoid stepping on my foot. 
I love you so much and thank you so much for listening. And then go out of the room. That's it. Don't try to solve the problem. Don't look for apologies. Don't look for promises. What you're doing is expressing negativity to him that's going to push his testosterone down. Why do you go through all of that? Well, what's interesting is I go through all of that if I communicate and I like it. You know why I like it? One, I have the power to get what I want. Two, it's loving. I'm being loving rather than just dumping out my feelings, knowing, knowing now you know, you dump out negativity, failure to a man is going to push him down, knowing it's not going to work. So it, it's not loving and it doesn't work. So I feel good because doing that, I know this is something that works and I'm going to get more of what I want. And it's also, I get to be loving. So that's the loving thing. So this is not a big burden. I've had some women go, oh, we have to walk on each other's eggshells around each other. So no, what you do is you respect someone, you honor someone. You don't, you're not a bull in a china shop. You don't just throw things around. You, you can throw things around with friends. You know, you can. Friends are different than an intimate relationship. You don't get naked and rub your bodies against each other if you're friends. <laughs> you have a distance. You don't see each other all the time. You don't depend on each other for your livelihood. You don't depend on each other as a major source of intimacy and sharing. There's a, a intimate sex relationship is totally different. And so we get so much sensitivity and vulnerability and it brings up all of our things inside. So yeah, you can share your feelings, but and don't get to the point where you can always share your feelings, but you can't share your feelings until you learn how to process your feelings. And often that means you have to go to your partner and whatever and feel good and then come back to your partner and say, oh, by the way, the other day, you know, it's not a big deal at all. But once again, you stepped on my foot. I'd appreciate it if you didn't uh, keep it really, really short. And then as you start getting better at this, keeping your heart open, you can reveal the deeper feelings that come up because it's great for you to share that with your partner, but let them to know that you move through it and you don't buy into it as he's this person you can't depend on and you don't love. Another question has come up. If she asks for help and the man refuses to help her, she loses trust in him. Is he his distorted masculine side then? Oh, thanks. You found that. Uh, oh, that's part of it. Again, ask for help is uh, honey, don't come, don't go to your cave. Okay. Or let's keep talking. He, he has his limits to how much he can do. So it's not like men can do anything. They want to help you for sure. That makes them very, very happy. That's his prime motive, but he has to take care of himself first. So that's key. It's not just dysfunction. It's how you ask. And it's also his own insecurities where he feels uh, another thing a man when he doesn't feel loved and appreciated whether you're appreciating or not some men just don't feel worthy of it and so they don't see it so let's keep that in mind as well but does he uh, uh, let me just see what that was even if, if responding if she asks for help and the man refuses to help her she loses trust in him. Is he then in his distorted masculine side? We just talked about that. If you fall in love with a oh, bummer, I forgot my point on that one. I guess I'm uh, probably have to finish up here. Let me quickly look at my schedule. Yeah, I have to finish up. Helena, keep those questions. I'll answer them next week on our Thursday session. And uh, that would be good. They're really, really good questions. And I appreciate them a lot. I appreciate your questions a lot because in my book that I'm going to be writing, I'm going to address all these questions that women have, a book for women only. Uh, but when, when it comes to a man's refusal to ask, to respond to a woman's question, there's so many things. And many times he's willing to do it. You just have to be a little persistent. And, and I tell that big story about my, my wife. Let's see if I have time for this story. Um, she says, John, uh, she brought the dog to the vet twice, complained about how off it was, how terrible the traffic was, how noisy it was, but the dog had to go three times. So on the third time she said, John, would you like to take the dog to the vet? I said, no. Now she could take that as I'm unwilling to help, but she asked me what I like to do it. Men are very precise about this. And then she said, what? You won't do it? I said, I, I'll do it. 
but you said you don't want to do it. I said, I, first of all, I don't want to do it. And I, you asked me if I would like to do it. If you asked me, do you want to do it? I say no too. why would anybody want to go with all that traffic and how noisy the dog was and all the problems you said, I, you don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But if it will make you happy, I didn't say I wouldn't do it. If it'll make you happy, I'll do it. Well, no, I don't want you to do it if you're not happy to do it. And I said, no, I'm a man. We're different. I'm happy to do it if it makes you happy. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me at all, she says. No, no, we get it. Just get it. If, if, why would I want to do this? Do you want to do it? No. Would you like to do it? No. Are you willing to do it? Yes, you're willing to do it. But the difference is you're willing to do it and you're going to grumble the whole way. The difference is I'm willing to do it, but only if I know you're going to go, that's so wonderful. I'm so grateful. I'm so appreciative. It will make you happy. I do things. There has to be an outcome. There has to be a reward. So if you communicate to me, if you do this, it will make me so happy. I don't want to do this at all. This is a horrible thing. I told you all those things. Would you do it? Then I said, sure, I would do it. But she said, do you want to do it? No, if it makes you happy, I'll do it. And then you go, yes, it would make me so happy. That's how men are. Just get it. That's how we all are on our male side. That's why you go to work. You don't go to a job that doesn't pay you. If you're on your male side, if you're on your female, you go to a job that you just do for free because you love doing it. Okay. But work, who wants to go take the dog to the vet through all the traffic and the noise and the barking and everything. And you know, she made it sound so awful, but I'm happy to do it. See, that's the difference of men. We are so noble. If you just get the nobility of masculinity is that we'll do anything if there's a reward. And of course, often women will say, oh, you're only doing it because you want a reward. Yeah, I'm doing it because I want a reward. And what is the reward I want? you happy what's wrong with that <laughs> anyway this is fun so there's a lot to do with this question he refuses to help her and then she well he just doesn't love me of course if he if he does it he loves you just get even if he grumbles the whole way through doing it if he did it it's because he loves you and he should be rewarded for that and next time he'll grumble less and grumble less and grumble less and he's very different from women if you ask women to do stuff and they grumble they don't just because you go, okay, thank you so much. They go, yeah, yeah, I had to do it. it. It doesn't take it away because appreciation takes away stress in men. It's what we live for is to see the outcome of what we do is making people happy, being of service, and happiness is the sign we did our job. So all we want to do is do our job. Amazing. And all women want is to have someone do a job for them. That's your femininity. That's where your happiness is, is you master the art of asking for help. And of course, Lauren's course is the, you know, how to get your me time is to get help from other people. So you have time to do what you love to do. To get that, that's what me time is. It's not like I have to do everything myself. I have too much me time. No, it's that you get other people to do stuff for you. So your life is full of things that you get to do that you love to do that are non-stressful for you. And this is what you have to do in this crazy world that's giving you a million reasons why you don't think that's possible. And that's the world you buy into. That's your illusion. You have the power within you to find that happiness inside and to start creating a life that supports you and being happier and happier. And from a place of happier, then you feel that masculine side of you that has a mission, that wants to make a difference and wants to make money and wants to have complete independence on one level. But on another level, you want complete dependence. You want interdependence independence and dependence and that's kind of an interdependence with life and all parts of those are being included inside of you so i have another presentation I have to do today it has been a great pleasure to spend this time with you thank you for your comments and questions helena if you can review all the questions and we want a, a long list of questions like you just did for me i appreciate it very very much thank you all for joining me i hope that you'll share this with your friends and family members and those of you who have lists or whatever, send it off so we can get more people coming to hear these Facebook Lives. And be sure to let people know that there's a whole 70 hours of, of that six weeks I did on personal growth where we did meditation, we did communication, we did healing the heart, we did success principles, and we did sex, love, romance, being single and dating on Fridays. So thank you again from my heart to yours. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day.